Once again, welcome to Christmas 2022 here at 922 Ministries. We are so thankful that you are joining us for the final week of our sermon series this Christmas season called Christmas Playlist. For those of you who've been here, you know that we've been focusing on four different songs, the centerpiece of our messages each and every week that are probably on every Christmas church playlist day, tomorrow, as Christmas have looked forward to our celebrations, and we'll wrap it up with our final one this afternoon, this evening, and for those of you who are here today, this morning. And I think it's something all of you can relate to, whether you've been here for the series or uh, you've been following us online, or if you haven't, we all know the concept of a playlist. Like in today's world, so many of them are put together for us. If you have Sirius XM radio in your car, or if you have Apple Music on your phone, or, or maybe you have Pandora or Spotify or something else that you listen to music, you know how many options are out there and how many playlists are available. For those of you who are a little bit older, and those of you who are a little bit younger, understand that back in the day, we also had playlists. They just weren't made for us. We put them on a mixed tape, or we burned a CD. Some of you are like going, a mixtape? Exactly. See, playlists are nothing new. Like for many, many years, people have put together lists of songs, compiled compiled them into books like hymnals, have put them together in maybe ways that help them categorize the, the songs that mean a lot to them with messages that have things in common. Like there are country music playlists, there are seasonal playlists like Christmas and boating season for those of you who live in Wisconsin. And weather like today, we can't wait for it to be here. Sorry, it's not going to be here for about another eight months. And yet sometimes on those playlists, whether it's your personal one or one that you listen to, you you sometimes stop and pause and go, I'm not so sure how that song fits on that playlist. For example, Shania Twain. Is she country or is she pop? I think there's still a great debate about which playlist and category she should be in. And if you listen to some of my wife's playlists, I sometimes wonder when she's playing DJ what that song has to do with that playlist. And today's song on our playlist, this Christmas song, is one of those... That should cause you to stop and pause, even though many of you might not understand why. And for our sermon today, we're going to wrap up actually with the most produced, the most published Christmas song for Christians of all time. It's in the Christmas section in the hymnal, the playlist that, that Christians have followed for many years. It's, it's found in almost every hymnal of every church. And it's called Joy to the World. Now, here's the thing I need to admit today before we go any further. I'm not all that big a fan. Now, before you boo me off the stage and ask another pastor to take over because it's your favorite Christmas song of all time, hear me out. Like, I want you to think about the words. We're going to sing them in a little bit. You've probably heard them many, many times. You've heard different versions maybe on your radio and your playlist for this Christmas. But you know what there is not in the song Joy to the World? There's no mention of Mary, there's no mention of the shepherds, there's no hark, the herald angels are singing, there's no mention even of wise men who came later, there's no mention of a manger, of Bethlehem, of anything Christmas related. There's not a single word in that song that talks about the day that Jesus Christ was born. So all of you out there who just like joy to the world, you're like, preach on, Pastor Tim, can I get an amen? And I know there's some of you who don't like this song, but you're embarrassed to do it right now, okay. And that's really my goal for you today. To encourage those of you who wonder about this song and its inclusion in Christmas, because you've wondered, like, where in all the world would joy to the world be included in Christmas when it doesn't mention the baby, the manger, Mary, Joseph, shepherds, angels, peace on earth, goodwill to men? I pray I can give you a different perspective on that, as I have learned for myself. And I also pray that for those of you who who love this song, who cherish this song, that you can find even an even deeper appreciation for it and a reason why it's been on your playlist and probably will remain there. But I pray that I can give you more than that today. I pray that I can give you a little bit about the song, why it might be included, the what 
behind the message of it, but also help you see the connection it has to Christmas and a takeaway that, that this song can be for you and for me, not just this Christmas, but each and every day as we live looking forward to the day when Jesus will return. Now, Isaac Watts wrote this song in the 1700s. A man with the last name of Lowell wrote the melody to it, and that's when it kind of took off in the 1800s and became a part of almost every Christmas playlist. But Isaac Watts, when he wrote this song, was actually writing poems based on the Psalms. And this psalm that we're going to see in just a second is the inspiration behind the song and, and why it makes our playlist. If you look at the words of, of, of the psalm writer that Isaac Watts captured, Psalm 98, one of his psalm poems that he wrote, he said, the psalm writer said this, Shout for joy to the Lord all the earth. Burst into jubilant song with music. Let the sea resound in everything in it, the world and all who live in it. Let the deep rivers clap their hands. Let the mountains sing together for joy. Let them sing before the Lord. For he comes to judge the earth. He will judge the world in righteousness and the peoples with equity. You see, one thing about this song in Christmas that you can say, it does identify the main character of the story and speak of that individual. His name is Jesus Christ. But what almost every theologian would tell you, and and just about every expert hymn writer would echo, is that this song is about Jesus coming. Just not his first one. Like the psalm writer is capturing words nearly a thousand years before Jesus was even born about this time and day when Jesus himself would return. Jesus had not even come yet. Jesus had not even been born yet. King David, who was his descendant, was alive and, and, and wrote these words of this psalm and, and records for us this amazing picture of what David believed to be true, what the psalm writer knew would happen one day, that, that Jesus would come. That he would come to judge. And that the earth would rejoice. And yet the earth had not yet had a chance to rejoice at his first coming. And so now that you know a little bit of the history behind the song, that it's about Jesus' second coming and not his first coming, you should be asking yourself then, why is this included with with a Christmas playlist in every hymnal that the Christian church has ever put together since it was written? Well, let me tell you why. Or better yet, let the story of that first Christmas tell you why. Like the story of what transpired the day that Jesus came to earth for the first time. Not in the way like the psalm writer knew it, but in a way that went unnoticed by almost everybody on the face of planet earth at the time, except for a few shepherds living out in the fields. If you want to know why joy to the world has everything to do with Christmas, what we can take away and apply this Christmas, listen again to the words I read just a little bit earlier from Luke chapter 2. Knowing that God will judge the peoples in righteousness with equity when he returns. There were shepherds living out in the fields nearby, keeping watch over their flocks at night. Now I just want to stop and pause for a second there because what we're going to see transpire was transformative in the lives of the shepherds. But I want you to put yourself in their shoes. It's an average day. They're at their job. They're, they're doing their work. It, it's probably nothing exciting. They're probably complaining a little bit. Who knows what had happened, how many sheep had run off uh, in the middle of what was transpired and going on. There was nothing special, nothing extraordinary. Just doing their job and their work when everything changed. An angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terrified. But the angel said to them, do not be afraid. I bring you good news that will cause great joy for all the people. Today in the town of David, a Savior has been born to you. He is the Messiah, the Lord. You see, what the psalm writer knew a thousand years before Jesus was born was that Jesus would be born. What the psalm writer knew and believed would happen is that God would keep his promises 
and would send a Savior to the earth who would do what needed to be done to rescue you and me and all people from their sins, from our brokenness, from the destination that sin deserves, being separated from God for all eternity. The angel's message to the shepherds was, I have good news that will cause you great joy. A Savior has been born to you. See, what the songwriter was writing about was Jesus' second coming because he believed, he trusted, he had heard what God had promised that it would happen and would bring great joy for you and me because attached to Jesus and his coming was Jesus' life, his death, his resurrection, our salvation from our sins. And he knew in his heart that what God promised would be true and one day when Jesus did all those things, he would return to heaven and rule over all things and await his return. And I want you to hear that this Christmas. What does this song have to do with Christmas? I would pitch to you everything because Jesus, if you're taking notes, like those of you who do this regularly here at our church service, says was joy for the world. Jesus was joy for the world. For the sin that Adam and Eve brought into the world, he was joy because he came to rescue God's people from their sins. He was joy for a person like David and Abraham and everyone who, who had lived up to that point with the hope in God's promise that he would come the first time. And so when you think about the song being about Jesus' second coming, you can't have a second coming without a first. And Jesus' first coming, the angel said, causes great joy for all people. Because all people need what Jesus came to bring, salvation. And so what did the shepherds do with that message? Like, look at the following words that we haven't heard yet about the Christmas story. When the angels had left them and, and gone into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, let's go to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has told us about. So they hurried off and found Mary and Joseph and the baby who was lying in the manger. Let's go. Uh, we've heard this message. The, the angels have told us this thing. The Lord has revealed to this to us. Let's go. They dropped everything. They left their jobs. They left their sheep. They, they left everything behind, and they went to see this thing that they had been told about because for 4,000 years, God had been telling his people about this. Every year, they had made annual trips to temples to, to celebrate, to, to prepare their hearts, to, to remind themselves of the things God had wanted them to remember about his coming each and every week, they gathered and worshiped regularly, maybe in their homes, maybe in a synagogue, hearing messages and reminders of the promise. And this day, that day, those words of the angels caused them joy. Because they knew what it meant for them. That God is faithful, that God is good, that God has delivered on his promise. Let's see this thing. We don't want to miss this thing. And you know what happened after they did? The last words of the Christmas story tell us the shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all the things they had heard and seen, which were just as they had been told. They heard, they went, they saw, and it caused them exactly what the angel said it would, great joy, joy for the world. A Savior has been born. And so maybe you understand just a little bit now why when this song was written without any intent of having it be on the Christmas playlist, when the, the beautiful melody that got put to it caused people to connect the dots and love to sing it at Christmas time, now fits in so beautifully with what we celebrate at Christmas. And the shepherds got it. It caused them great joy. Joy for the world is found in Jesus. 
But I don't want it to be lost on you and me when we sing this song of where we stand in history right now. Like you and I live in between that first coming, which caused great joy for the shepherds, and his second coming, which will cause, as the Bible says, Christians to rejoice. And I don't want you to miss that truth of why this song, that message, is not just about the shepherds and one that caused them joy, but, but I want you to see what the reality of Christmas and Jesus' return mean for you and for me. I trust in your unfailing love, the psalm writer said. My heart rejoices in your salvation. I will sing the Lord's praise for he has been good to me. Jesus was that first Christmas, as the angels said, joy for the world. His coming meant God was faithful. His coming meant salvation was possible. His coming allowed it to take place that a perfect substitute for you and for me, a rescuer from sin, eternally with God, was made available to us. But it wasn't just for them. It wasn't just for that time. The psalm writer tells us that, that joy is something that is for you and for me. If you're, you're taking notes, it's not that Jesus was that first Christmas joy for the world. Jesus is. He is. Right now, in between that first coming and his second coming, joy for you. Those words of the psalm writer remind us of why. Listen again to the words of, of Psalm 13. But I trust in your unfailing love. For God so loved the world that he sent his one and only son. Joy is, is for you. Because you know Jesus came and, and what he did saved you. My spirit rejoices in God, my Savior. The one who saves me, the psalm writer says, gives me reason to rejoice, just like the shepherds did that first Christmas, just like one day Christians will do at the end of time. Jesus is joy for you right here, right now. This song reminds us of it as we look back on his first coming and look ahead to his second coming. Which is why the writer of Psalm 13, King David, said, I will sing, which is what we've been doing this entire series, and we're going to do a little bit more for the, before the end of our service today. I will sing the Lord's praise. Why? Because he has been good to me. Joy is not just something that was for the world. Joy is for you, and Jesus is the one that causes joy. Because he saved you. And one day in the future, he'll return to make that joy complete. You see, when you look at the song, and we'll just take a look at a few of the words, it gives us very clear reminders of how right now, right here, this Christmas, every day, Jesus is joy for you and for me. And I don't want you to miss it when we sing it in just a few minutes. The words of verse 1, joy to the world, the Lord is come. Let earth receive her king. Let every heart prepare a room. Like there is joy right now, right here, this Christmas and every day because the one who came is king. The prophet Isaiah predicted of his kingdom there will be no end. He hadn't even come. His manger was his first throne. He, he ascended back to his eternal throne that's the one that gives great joy, the one who rules and reigns over all things for your good, who as a king wore a crown and went to a cross so that sin, death, and the power of the devil could be destroyed forever. That is joy right here, right now, and for eternity for you, the king. And can I ask you to Take note of that last verse. If Jesus has joy for you right now, don't crowd out the space in your heart. Don't make room for every other thing in this world and leave him off to the side. Like this Christmas, 
and when Christmas is gone, don't let all the things going on around you to, to cause Jesus to, to not have a place in your heart. Because one day he will return. And my friends, he does not want you to miss out on the joy of heaven. And yet right now, in the here and now, there sometimes isn't always that much joy. or So it feels, right? Which is why I would have you remember the difference between happiness and joy. Like, happiness is circumstantial. Joy is based on facts. Happiness comes and goes. Joy is permanent. Happiness is based on circumstances, and, and joy is based on anything but. And in this life and in this world, even over the next few days, these next two days, these next 48 hours of opening presents and getting together with family and friends, you will have the fluctuations of moments of happiness and some not so much. When you got the present that you really wanted and you missed out on the one that everyone else got, like, that's happiness. It comes and it goes. It's fleeting. But joy right here and right now is permanent. And I need you to hear that and know that. And it's why the, so uh, the songwriter and, and Isaac Watts, when he, he wrote it, went back to what the here and now means for us before Jesus returned. No more let sins or sorrows grow nor thorns infest the ground. He comes to make his blessings flow far as the curse is found. Have you ever wondered why that verse was included? Because it points back to the garden. It points back to the garden where sin entered the world and brokenness has never left the world since then. And right here, right now, we celebrate Jesus' first coming. He dealt with our sin. He dealt with our sins so that we could have eternity. That is yours. That is mine. It can't be taken away and it can't be stolen. But right now, in the midst of this world, there is so much brokenness that the devil would love to rob you of Jesus and steal your joy. Like we live in a world where there is hate and violence, where there is racism and murder, where there are relationships that, that fall apart. There, there is so much brokenness. Jesus' first coming did not end the brokenness. He dealt with the brokenness. He paid the price for sins, but there is still sin, and it will rage a war this side of heaven until that day when he returns. As you celebrate his first coming of what it means for you spiritually, that eternity is secure, look forward to his second coming and bring them together to understand the ultimate joy that will happen on that day when there will be no more sin and no more sadness and no more brokenness, no more sins, no more thorns, only blessings as far and wide as his love is, will be those blessings because the curse of sin will be eradicated. Joy to the world. Hold on to that joy in your circumstances when they are hard, when there are tears. Jesus is joy for you right now in the midst of that broken world. Until that day when he comes back and, and he rules over all things with truth and grace and will stand victorious and all the nations will see it and he will prove it the glories of his righteousness, and he will give you the lasting wonders of his love. Joy to the world was not written for Christmas. But everything about joy to the world, the Jesus who will come back and the Jesus who first came, comes together so beautifully in picture. It, 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 and more importantly for you and for me, has great significance because at the heart and center of Christmas, at the heart and center of Christianity is this reality that what Jesus came to do and one day he will come back to do is give you unending, lasting joy. It cannot be taken away. And one of his disciples knew that. In fact, Peter probably thought of you when he wrote it. He was thinking of the people he was writing to when he wrote these words to, to Christians who were scattered over Asia, Christians who were maybe about to face persecution. He said this, Though you have not seen him, Jesus, you love him. And even though you do not see him now, you believe in him and are filled 
with an inexpressible and glorious joy. For you are receiving the end result of your faith, the salvation of your souls. Jesus was joy for the world. Jesus is joy for you. And one day Jesus will return and, and all will rejoice. Every Christian for eternity will be filled with unending joy. And that's why maybe it's so beautiful that one of the most famous Christmas songs of all times isn't supposed to be on a Christmas playlist. Because you know what I thought about when I dug into that and, and took that to heart? This. Joy isn't limited to a season. Like, joy is not just a Christmas thing. Like, joy is not just limited to these few days when we get together and, and long for peace on earth. And you no, know, joy is not limited to season. Christmas does not have a copyright on it. Joy instead is found in the Savior, who's with you in every season. So, for those of you who are new to the season of being a Christian, I pray. I pray that this Christmas fills you with great joy, but that you hold on to it, that you make room for him in your heart each and every day to grow in that faith so that one day you do not miss out on, on any joy. For those of you who are in the season of life and, and maybe it's the end season, hold on to that joy because when everything starts to break down, when you, you look ahead and you consider that your days are short, remember that your eternity is long because of Jesus, joy. If right now you're in a difficult season, like maybe it's work-related, maybe it's school-related, maybe it's relational-related, maybe it's health-related, remember Jesus is not seasonal. He doesn't come and go. It's not circumstantially based. It's based on the facts that he came and he died and he rose and one day he will return in all his glory. Joy to the world, the Lord has come. Joy to the world. Jesus is with us right now in every season. And there will be great joy on the day he returns.